She's a remarkable boat, and she also sails a remarkable river. When the Adelaide was launched, the Murray was a lifeline, the highway to inland Australia. The Adelaide, and a hundred boats like her, opened up no less than one-seventh of Outback Australia. They took supplies and people upstream and brought out the great wealth of the inland, wool. Those days are long gone, but the paddle wheelers are still on the Murray. This is a magic river, and we're going to travel most of its length. We'll pass through three states, but the river doesn't really belong to any of them. It's a world of its own. The Murray enters the ocean in South Australia, but it rises close to the east coast in the Snowy Mountains. With its tributary, the Darling, it forms Australia's only great inland river system, linking South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, and Southern Queensland. Much of the Murray's flow depends on the snow melt of the Australian Alps. But this snow melt becomes really important over 2,000 kilometres downstream. In dry South Australia, the Murray performs something close to a miracle. It provides much of South Australia's water supply. The Murray brings water and life to country that would otherwise be desert. In fact, the contrast between the river world and the surrounding country is quite startling. South Australians were the first to see that the Murray might also become a river highway. In 1853, the government offered a reward of £2,000 for the first person to take a steamboat to the Darling Junction. Not far from here, one man was already planning to do just that. The town of Manham was founded by the same man, and fairly claimed to be the oldest of all the riverboat towns. It was William Randall who built and launched the very first paddle steamer on the Murray in 1853. Randall was a local flour miller with an adventurous spirit. His Mary Ann wasn't the most graceful boat ever built, but it did the job. Apart from this monument, another remarkable relic of the Mary Ann still survives here in Manham. Randall was neither sailor nor engineer. That may be why he gave the world something it had never seen before or since, a square boiler. Everyone knew a boiler had to be round to cope with the stresses of heat and pressure. Everyone except Randall. As his boiler got hotter, it started to swell and groan. They say wise men ran for their lives. Randall just bounded with bullock chains and went on stoking. His judgment was vindicated. This boiler took him all the way to the Darling. He was the first man to get there and definitely under his own steam. But he didn't win the prize. When the competition was announced, Randall had already completed his boat and it didn't meet the rules. But Randall had proved the Murray could be navigated and his historic voyage was to change the river forever. These days, most river journeys are short cruises, and the cargo is people, tourists. The Proud Mary is a new boat, but, as you might guess from her lines, the romance of the past is still one of the great attractions of a Murray cruise. The other great attraction is the river itself. These lower reaches are 
probably the most spectacular sailing water anywhere on the river. Sunset on the river. The proud Mary ties up for a sing-along. It's a time to feel close to the bush and close to the river too, particularly in the company of someone like Dick Bromhead. Thank you very much. And now, why don't we hear one from a real river man? He loves the river and he lives on it. Young Dick, good on you, Dick. <laughs> Not so much as a young pet. Well, this here is a song it's called a nautical yarn. It goes like this. I sings of a captain who's well known to fame. For the naval commander Bill Jinks be his name. And he sails where the muddies, muddy waters do flow. Does this fresh water shell back with his yo heave ho? Tell me yo ho, yo heave ho. From the port of Waganya his vessel were bound. Oh, when the night came upon him and darkness around, not a star on the water. Dick Bromhead is a true river man. His songs bring to life the romance of the past. And that's just what these modern day travellers have come searching for. <laughs> From the very beginning, there was a difficulty in using the Murray as a water highway. The river has no sea port. It enters the ocean through Lake Alexandrina. Treacherous sandbars guard the way to the sea. That's why the river trade soon came to be based not on the ocean, but on railhead ports upstream. Morgan, in South Australia, was one of the first. South Australia had hoped for a lion's share of the river trade. In fact, just to retain a fair share, she also had to build railhead ports upriver. In the 1880s, Morgan was South Australia's biggest inland port. Morgan's a sleepy town today. The river trade is a thing of the past. The old wharf is almost derelict. But Morgan's days as a bustling port are well within living memory. Oh, well, in the high days, you had the cargo boats there, be perhaps three or four come in, unloading onto the wharf, and the big uh, shed, they had two hydraulic cranes in there, and five on the wharf, and uh, there was cargo going into the shed, and then cargo came up on the freight trains to go up river. Ivy Carr still vividly remembers the 1920s when steamers still met the trains from Adelaide to carry their passengers on upriver. You could pick up passengers in Murray Bridge, go to Morgan, get on to the gym and go to Mildura and then pick up on the Eleanor the Ruby there for Swan Hill. So you could go the whole way in the river by the boat. Ivy arrived in Morgan in 1919 when the river trade was still in its heyday. She was an English war bride. Her Australian soldier husband was a river man who brought Ivy home to the Murray. In her 90s now, Ivy still vividly remembers her first sight of the river. In fact, she has total recall. On the Monday morning after I arrived in Australia, and that would be the um, six, seven, eight, nine, about the 10th of October, 1919 and she came round the bend to come up to the Morgan Wharf and she looked an absolute picture. She was snow white and I stood there in trance. It was the first time that I'd seen one of the passenger boats come in.
One boat Ivy remembers well is preserved at Manham. These days, the paddle steamer Marion is landlocked, but still enough like her old self to make Ivy feel at home. Our visit aboard stirred memories of the kind of men who worked the river. <laughs> hard working, hard drinking, hard swearing, and they had no use for phonies, no way at all. You either pulled your weight or you went on the bank. That was the way they were. A, the rivermen had a law unto themselves. After 30 years watching the steamers, Ivy signed on herself in 1949. The Marion's dining room was Ivy's domain. So was the kitchen, and I suspect she ruled both with a rod of iron. She certainly learned how to hold her own in a man's world. And Skipper said to me, he said, Nancy, when we get up the reach, he said, I'll come down and we'll go through the fridges and things. And uh, I said to him, now listen to me, I said, you pay the cook £11 a week. And he said, that's right. Well, I said, you don't think I'm going to work for 10, do you? I said, because if I've got to do the same job, I want the same pay. And I held a gun at his head, you see. Bob Reed was the skipper. He said, all right. And I said, what about my stewardess job? I said, that's got to be done. The passengers were very good. They made their own beds because they knew what was going on. And I, so I said, no, I want half my stewardess pay. That was another two pound a week. But I ended up with 14 pound a week altogether. Which was pretty good money in those it days. It was good money in those days, yes. I saved enough money while I worked on here to buy a house. It was good money, but Ivy worked hard for it, cooking for 50 passengers from dawn to dark. And we never said lunch, it was always dinner, and it was at 12 o'clock. Soup, and then straight into the meat courses. There would be perhaps a braise or curry, always a roast, and vegetables, plenty of vegetables and plenty of everything. Even with the help of Ivy's gargantuan meals, the steamers found they couldn't compete with the faster passenger services of road and rail. Regular passenger runs were stopped in the early 1950s and the Marion went out of service. But perhaps her owners should have held on a little longer. By the 1960s, a new passenger era was already beginning a cruise boat era that has seen bigger boats than ever before launched on the river. The grandest of all is the Murray Princess. She's nothing less than an inland liner, and this newest ship on the river is also no less than the biggest Australian paddle wheeler ever built. Bow to stern, the Princess is designed for luxury cruising. Five-star service, plus the bonus of the river. Mind you, I'm not sure what the old rivermen would have made of all this. Father Bear. Coffee for you, my dear. One lump or two. While the Murray Princess has more crew than an old-time riverboat, it's still hard work serving 120 passengers who have come aboard purely for pleasure. For all the luxury, it's the river itself that draws people on board and draws them back. It's a simple fact the tension unwinds as the river unfolds. <laughs> the sheer size of the princess restricts her to the Murray's wide, lower reaches. This is the largest ship in Australia on inland waters. It's the uh, largest by far. Most mm. of the others are only a third or a quarter of the size of this. 
Um, this one's a ship, not a boat, is that correct? This is a ship. This is a ship. This is a ship, no yeah. boat. Uh, how, do, how do you compare life here to the open sea? Much more hectic. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's yeah. hazardous all the way, isn't it? There's yeah. not, a, not a moment where you can relax, as I read. No, you don't get any relaxing periods at all. Um, you're travelling very close, as you can see, to the bank all the time. And um, you've got a lot of hazards. Um, we've got snags like we have just ahead of us here, and I'm starting to slide into. Oops. And, uh, <laughs> um, it takes a fair bit of getting out of some of those situations. So tell me about this special ship's whistle. Oh, that's very fascinating. This is our answer to the calliopes on the Mississippi. This is an air-operated horn, and it has a very unusual effect as you can hear when I operate it. We can get all sorts of notes out of there. Thanks to new vessels like the Murray Princess, at least one trade on the Murray, the passenger trade, is probably bigger today than ever before. Uh, in the old days on the river, passengers were just a sideline. Most of the trade was cargo. Most of it came from the backs of these blokes. Wool. Before paddle steamers came along, horse and bullock teams could take months to get 40 bales of wool down to the sea. Steamers could tow barges carrying 50 times as much, 2,000 bales, and they reached the sea in weeks. Wool made the river trade, and in turn, riverboats helped make the wool growers rich. Pastoral empires and the homesteads that went with them grew up all along the Murray. From the air, you can see why the Murray posed such a challenge to navigation. Her bends are so tortuous, they almost meet themselves coming back. The river distance is usually three times the straight line distance. That's one reason the river trade died when more direct forms of transport came along. Even so, the Murray was the wool growers' lifeline for 50 years, and so was its great tributary, the Darling. Joining the Murray at Wentworth, the Darling is longer than the Murray itself. It was an even riskier river to navigate. It drained dry country, and it didn't always flow, but when it did, it spanned the whole of New South Wales. Paddle steamers pioneered the Darling and the wool growers followed them upstream. Like most settlers along the Darling, the people here at Lelma Station built their shearing shed right on the river and it's still in use. Owning a sheep station doesn't always mean running a great pastoral empire. For Alan Lambert and his sons, shearing is a family affair. These days, the wool doesn't go out by river anymore, but Alan can still remember when it did. Uh, I remember them quite well, though. What used to happen around here? Well, the boats would come up and pick up the wool from just down here, and it'd come in from Garnpang, Top Hut, Turley, and all this place is out 30 odd mile out. And they'd load them. See that train there? They'd pick it up there, and swing that around there, and pick up three or four bales and swing it back in and drop it into the empty barge. And how many bales would a barge that size take? About five or six hundred. Goodness me. Yeah. No, big loads. Uh, all evening you'd come up 
by river in those days. There was no motor transport. And then supplies would come yeah, on come the up, return trip. Yeah, and then they'd take them all back. And where did it go to? Morgan. To Morgan in South Australia. Mm. Shearers are legendary hard workers of the bush. But I doubt if they had life any tougher than the rivermen, who first had to load their barges, then fight snags and sandbars every inch of the way to wrestle their giant loads downstream. You don't have to step far back from the river to find a very different world. In places, actual desert. But the soil around here is a lot better than it looks. Ironically, so close to the river, all it lacks is water. There had always been dreams of making this desert bloom. Today, much of it does. The irrigated lands of the Murray stretch for hundreds of kilometres through South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. The region is one of the great fruit bowls of the world. Peaches, apricots, pears, grapes and oranges. Sunshine and Murray water create an orange harvest that lasts practically all year round. Mildura is an oasis of year-round sunshine whose greenness depends almost entirely on irrigation. It's one of Australia's few real inland cities. A hundred years ago, Mildura was a town in the middle of nowhere. The modern city grew because of irrigation from the Murray and the river trade. In the early days, Mildura was too remote to transport fresh fruit, so the first thing settlers learned was to dry their harvest. Still today, most of the grape harvest goes to the drying racks, where nature becomes the grower's ally. Paddle wheelers were vital when Mildura began. They not only supplied the town, they took its fruit out. These days, the steamer Melbourne operates as a tourist boat, a vivid reminder of Mildura's past. The Melbourne is one of only a handful of boats still running in steam. She's been lovingly restored by her owner, Albie Poynton. So, Albie, were you born? No, not really. I came from South Australia originally, but uh, I've been on the river quite a long time now, getting under woods uh, 40 years. Do you ever feel like you've had enough? In some ways, but something seems to drag you back to the river. Yeah. Uh, the, the river is a challenge, yeah. and uh, you can never be sure that you're in front, because just when you think everything is going right, you'll get a flood. 
and the house gets flooded and the boats rise up and you have problems in manoeuvring and then uh, after a flood there's usually a low river and then you have problems of sandbars and, and going aground and, uh, uh, and, and, and that's the story right along, there's challenges the whole time. As often happens on the river, Albie, in his turn, is now passing the Melbourne on to a new skipper, his son, Chris. I've sort of had no choice in the matter. I've sort of just grown up with it all my life. I probably wouldn't know what it'd be like without it, I suppose. Originally started going on the boat with Dad, working school holidays and weekends and things like that. And, and the engine's how old? Uh, the engine was originally built in 1910 in Gainsborough, England. It was shipped to Australia and put in the Melbourne under construction. And Melbourne was built and commissioned in 1912. So mm. it's still the original boiler mm. engine. It can take three hours to get up a good head of steam, and this morning, we need all the steam we can get. We're heading upstream to reenact one of the greatest of all river traditions, a grudge race. Somehow, in the entire history of the river, there always seem to be too many boats chasing too few cargoes. After the shearing, there was always a frantic race to be first to bring down the wall. Sometimes the river was so low, the rivermen said they were riding the dew. Perhaps they raced to Mildura also. Whether they did or not, they're certainly racing today. It's a big day for Mildura a chance for the veterans of the river to strut their stuff. It's also our chance to see the Murray teeming with paddle boats, just like the old days. No worries about low water today. There's enough room for all of these steamers to race side by side. Albie Poynton's Melbourne is a popular fancy for the race, but she's not the only veteran here. They once called the Rothbury the Greyhound of the River, so she might turn into a dark horse. The Murray River Queen also comes from a top stable. She's sister ship to the Murray Princess. The Avoca is a veteran too, a workhorse for 113 years and a showboat since as far back as the 1930s. The Coonawarra was the very first new era passenger boat, so she has something to prove too. They're racing and the Rothbury takes an early lead. really at stake here is pride. But among old river skippers, pride is prize enough. I think we'll have a good chance this time. We'll get the slow race and we might even take a good chance at it, of winning it. We'll get a little flying start too, I'll get a little trick up in the sleeve. All right? I, I don't, I think it's anybody's race. Ah, oh, well, we'll beat them, it's fashion. The
There is a final winner, that dark horse, the Rothbury. But by the end of the day, it hardly seems to matter. None of the cargoes the steamers took out was more important than the people they brought in. People to settle and stay in country thought of as wild and remote. Pioneer Town at Swan Hill celebrates the new life that paddle boats introduced to the riverbanks. In their wake, bustling new towns sprang up all along the Murray. Towns like Swan Hill began as ports, supplying the hinterland. Everything a settler needed could be brought in by steamer. Building supplies, heavy machinery, farming equipment. The amenities of life also came by river. Fashions, furniture, cheaper and fresher food, and ever more people to service the growing towns. The old gem is the focal point of the town. In her heyday, she was the biggest passenger steamer on the river. She's still afloat, and so is her last skipper. Paddy Hogg. So this is the wheelhouse, eh? Yeah, bad enough to that. A few memories for you. Oh, my word. How difficult was it to handle a boat this size, Paddy? Oh, that's a beautiful boat to handle. One of the best, then. Couldn't find a better one than the old Jim. Are they all the same, or all got their oh, own characteristics? Oh, no, no. Every boat will vary. You can, uh, you can build them from uh, two boats. You could build them from the same set of plans and both boats would be entirely different to handle. It's just anything little quirk in the shape of the keel of it can alter the whole handling ability of the boat. The Piap is Swan Hill's pride and joy. And this is another case of a father and son on the river. Good. Welcome aboard. Ted. Hey. Bill. Teddy, nice to meet you. Welcome aboard. Thanks very much. That's quite okay. How will we be with the water this low? Uh, we'll be pretty right. We've still got 13 inches to go before its normal southern level, so we'll be quite okay. You might see the dust come up, but it'll be okay, mate. Orphaned as a little boy, Paddy grew up on the river made it his home. When you've got a boat or on a boat on the river, you are independent. You've got your home there, you've got a good cabin to sleep in, you've got somewhere to have a feed and a good, you know, reasonable style if you want to. Nice and comfortable, a way of earning a few bomb. Look, you name it, we carried it. Uh, general cargo, every so all the big stores along the rivers used to get there. Stores, the sugar, the tea, the sponge, uh, the whole lot of it bought by boat. The cheapest and quickest means when the river was high. But it must have been pretty hard work all the, all the same. Well, I think it, it, I don't think it, I know it. It was damn hard work. In the old days, the boats ran 24 hours a day, steaming right through the night. Dusk is a special time on the river, with an atmosphere all its own.
darkness lends the river a special beauty, but it also hides its constant dangers, snags, reefs, and sandbars. Well, yes, it held its dangers. You had to be sure of your river. You had to be sure of the bend you're in. Take the bend. But it was picturesque. And I think there was nothing nicer than traveling the river at night time. To look out ahead of you, see the trees, and see that soft old kerosene light shining into them, the birds coming out, flying into it, and on, scared, you know, the birds, they'd fly out and flutter around and they'd get out of the light and they'd be confused with the darkness again. And it was wonderful. <laughs> I, I was told I just had to keep smiling. Well, the old timers were right. Life on the river is tough. And these people think they're on holidays, don't you? Hooray! 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 Another, another day, another steamer. The Emmy Lou is bound for Echuca. And this is how skipper Mac Carling tries to make passengers feel they're on a real river journey, not just a cruise. Doing very well. All the old steamers burned wood, and it had to be loaded from stockpiles along the river. The Emmy Lou is a replica, but in one way she's the most authentic boat on the river. She's the only overnight cruise boat still driven by steam. So, a voyage aboard the Emmy Lou is a journey back to the past. It's hard to think of a better way to travel up river to our next port of call, the city of Achuca. It's in Echuca, more than anywhere, that the past, present and future of the riverboat age all come together. Echuca Wharf still looks colossal, yet it's now only a third of its original length. The wharf's great height was to cope with floodwaters that could raise the river level by as much as 10 metres in a matter of hours. It was here at Echuca that the very first railhead met the river way back in 1864. The Victorian government set out to stop its trade going to South Australia and succeeded. Echuca became the capital of what was known as the top end of the river. In her heyday, the home port for 35 steamers and 70 barges. Today, Echuca is again the busiest port on the river and a favourite destination for tourists. The whole city is a celebration of the paddle steamer age. Echuca's old port precinct has been revitalised to capture the atmosphere of the 1880s. The remarkable thing is, 20 years ago, most of these buildings were derelict. Restoration came just in time, and port manager Helen Colson was involved from the start. 
it was a very opportune time because it was before the days when everything had to be user pays and cost effective as happens now and I don't believe that we would have been able to do it. Had we left it say another 10 or 15 years I think the money would have been too great. What would have happened on the site had you not done it? Well if we hadn't got it just at that precise moment I think a lot of them would have deteriorated and gone. The Bridge Hotel particularly was in a bad state and the Bond store and both of those are the two oldest buildings still existing in the town and this of course is where it all happened to start with so it was important that we retain those and the Bridge Hotel it was suggested was going to be sold as a service station site at a time when service stations were going up on every corner. The Port of Echuca is a remarkable success story. By reviving her past, a quiet country town has won a whole new future. If Echuca owes a special debt to any one person, it's Kevin Hutchison. Kevin has supervised the rebuilding of all their boats, and for every boat he restores, it seems there's another waiting. The boats are built of red gum. It's as hard as iron and riverboat planks are nearly eight centimetres thick. The Arbuthnot is Kevin's latest challenge. Her restoration will be a slow and painstaking process. After decades of neglect, Echuca's old paddle wheelers have been perfectly restored to their fighting trim. They're back on the water and back in steam. Echuca's star attractions make a brave show on the river. Great survivors, restored to look just as they did in the golden age of the river trade. Pevensey was built in 1912, one of the last steamers ever to carry wool. As well as towing barges, Pevensey could take 800 bales in her own holds. We met her companion, the Adelaide, right at the start of our journey. She's the oldest wooden hulled paddle steamer still afloat on this or any river. She's a graceful boat whose lines still demonstrate the skills of the early craftsmen of the river. As you may have noticed, Murray paddle wheelers come in all shapes and sizes. They say that where Americans on the Mississippi found a good design and stuck to it, every Australian skipper had ideas of his own. Typical? To my mind, Phil Simmons and his friends are the luckiest skippers afloat. They own this boat, the old Etona. As the cross suggests, she was originally built as a mission boat to carry religion into the wild country upriver. Pevensey's like an old Sherman tank, isn't it? But that's what I imagine it would be like. Uh, and this is like a Maserati. This oh, one. oh, yeah, she's beautiful. beautiful. This is beautiful. And it's got a nice, beautiful little set of engines in it. Oh. They're original engines, though. Uh, 1898. They were actually built in England in 1897 and shipped out. But this one's very nice. Very nice and very maneuverable indeed. Would you like to try it? I'd love to. Oh, oh, right? Yes, right. Oh. <laughs> now keep going that way. Uh. Now, you watch that steering pole, you see that steering pole there? Yeah, yeah. Up to the steering pole, and then if you just... All right, turn right, now just get it to the to pole, yeah? Just okay, get it, got it. Just get it to turning just enough, hold it there, hold it there. Yeah. We'll go around this bend. All right. Well, that's nice. 
That's going around easily, easy to steer. Probably. Yeah. This is what I've been waiting for for the last 2,000 kilometres. Yeah. A chance to drive a boat like this. It is a boat, isn't it? It is a boat, yes. It is a Not boat. a ship, it's a boat. It's a ship, it's a boat. You don't really have to be a steamer skipper to feel the magic of the Murray. Every year, thousands of travellers set out on their own river adventure. Days, optimists called the Murray Australia's Nile. It isn't quite that. Actually, the Murray is a very slender thread, perhaps too slender for the demands we make. These days, the river is managed every inch of the way. Locks and weirs control water flow all the way downstream. The locks are a highlight of a river trip, but they've also changed this once free-flowing river into a series of lakes. The resulting rise in water level means that many red gums lining the river banks have literally drowned. A stark reminder of the cost of progress. The Murray Fruit Bowl has given us abundance, but the combination of irrigation and forest clearing has caused another great problem, salt. The problem must be solved. Downstream, a million people depend on fresh Murray water, and the river will have to be looked after much better in the future than it has been in the past. On its ever-changing course, the river leaves backwater billabongs and overflow lagoons. For the old skippers, these were part of the challenge. For today's traveller, they all add to the river's charm. The simple truth is that as the river unfolds before you, nothing else seems to matter. That's the appeal today and I think it was exactly the same in the days of the river trade. In fact, the first pioneer of the river, old William Randall back in Manham, really said it all. It is, Randall said, a very risky, uncertain trade, but somehow I've been unable to take to anything else. Try to understand this land, Australia, Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries. Mother of us all, beneath the Southern Cross, in her frame of peaceful seas. Try to understand this land, Australia. Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries. Mother of us all, beneath the southern cross, in her frame of peaceful.